Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. It's incredible to see so many people here. I was hoping it would just be three or four people that I already knew, but uh, <laughs> as it goes. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is I'm going to give you some advice based on my experience as a um, professional maker and uh, the kind of mistakes I've made along the way and the good things I've done along the way, but also some of the advice that I've picked up from the people that I've worked with along the way, including um, around about 100 members of the kiln rooms we have now and probably over the last two years about 1,000 people who've gone through our classes. Um, so this is me at work in my studio. I am or have been a producer of ceramic tableware. Um, I studied from a school age of 14, did GCSE, A-level, um, went to the Glasgow School of Art for my BA and then went to the Royal College of Art for my MA. I had a 10-year total ceramic education. Um, so I've been through everything that any one of you has been through really at some stage. Um, so I graduated in 2011 with my master's from the Royal College and since then I've been producing my own tableware range um, which has gone from strength to strength. It's seen me uh, win a couple of Designer of the Year awards, uh, working with Calvin Klein, working with artists on commissions like Howard Hodgkin and Peter Doig. Um, so I've kind of come to a period in my life where uh, this is going to change a little bit. And that's partly down to the fact that I've been working on the Kiln Rooms project. So um, in around about 2012, 2013, I was the co-founder of uh, Turning Earth Ceramic Studio, um, which I left after about six months to pursue a, a sort of different model to that. And that ended up being the Kiln Rooms. Um, and since then, we've gone from strength to strength. And this week, we opened two brand new studios. One uh, is a completely new one, which houses up to 90 members and probably around 100 people in classes at any time. And the other is um, a refurb of our original studio, which um, now houses 25 full-time makers. Um, this is my personal studio, my fortress of solitude, if you like somewhere where I can close the door on all those faces for a little while. Um, as you'll see later on as I talk about this, um, I'm really keen on people engaging and working with each other. Um, but at my stage, I need a little bit of personal space as well. So this is my studio based in Hoxton. And this is one of the Kiln Room Studios. This was the original one, and this photo was taken a couple of weeks after we opened the first studio. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the marketplace and opportunities and where we stand today and where you can move through and uh, up to. Um, there's never been a better time for ceramics. It's absolutely shit hot right now. It's, um, it's everywhere. It's infiltrating everything. Um, it's a lot to do with the times that we live in. Um, but one of the main key points with it is that handmade is now being associated with luxury. The days of bling are over. It doesn't have to be painted gold anymore. It doesn't have to be Gucci or Prada. People are starting to um, really understand the value in the handmade, um, which is really kind of having a knock-on effect for all of us. And as you can see out there, it's absolutely ram-packed full of people. The interest in the um, ceramic market and also the wider crafts is really at its peak. Um, information is everywhere at the moment. Um, obviously, we've got new technologies, but magazines and things are still striving. There's uh, blogs, vlogs, everything you want to get into, um, and social media. Now, this has really changed the landscape that we work in. Um, it's kind of carved a new virtual landscape and a marketplace where uh, you get your sofa surfers. Really, so you can be sat on your sofa at home and you can be buying craft, which before was inaccessible to you unless you could go to a gallery and see it physically. Um, also, you know, we live in a, a time of uh, free movement and free trade, although obviously uncertain times at the moment. Um, but globalization is something that's kind of hit our market quite interestingly at the same time that technology has allowed us to reach those markets. Um, so now we are developing trade with international shows and e-commerce and there are galleries from all around Europe and the globe that are contacting British makers in particular and trying to sell their products overseas. 
But, I mean, how do we get there, really? Uh, let's go back to the starting point. And I don't want to dwell on this for too long, but it is a, a, an important point, and that is formal education um, and the decline thereof. So myself on the left here at 14, making my first coil pot, and uh, a very young Adam Ross Ceramics in the background there, um, who's now also a very successful potter. Um, so as I said, I was introduced to ceramics at a very early age, um, but unfortunately it's been pretty much cut at the throat in um, lower education, under education, whatever you want to call it. Um, but from a young age, you know, a lot of schools still have kilns, but they're never fired up. And I think it's, it's actually our responsibility now to take that burden on and ensure that education comes back into a grassroots level so that it gets uh, pushed forward and that can develop further in the education system. So currently we have in the UK only two remaining full-time dedicated ceramics BA courses, and that is of course Central St. Martins where we're standing today and Cardiff. And one of the incredible things about these two courses is that they're fighting against some of the reasons that all of the other courses have closed down. Now, it is a sad, sad situation in a lot of ways that, you know, ceramics often needs to be pigeonholed into a certain criteria, whether it's design or applied arts or whatever, but it, it is a grey area, ceramics. It spreads across so many factors. And to validate a course within those pigeonholed criteria is incredibly difficult, which is why these two colleges that are remaining, and especially the one we're stood in, um, are really impressive to have kind of withstood that and fight against it and they're developing new ideas and keeping it relevant, which is something we all have to do on a personal level, but on a, on a formal education level, it's incredibly important. But the powers that be don't necessarily see that. So it's, uh, it's a credit to the colleges that still are there. But what we're finding in the marketplace is there is a resistance to this. People still want to learn, so there are other places and other options. Um, pottery evening classes, this is uh, a drunken rabble at the kiln rooms having their uh, evening classes and their first access to clay. Um, evening classes and college courses are absolutely thriving at the moment. They are full to the brim. We have a waiting list of around 400 people waiting for courses at the kiln rooms. Um, and it's a, it's a real sign of the times. People want to touch clay, people want to be involved with the material, yet it is being cut from formal education. So. Where is the trade-off there? All I can say from my perspective is that the more people we have interested in it, the more people will want to be in courses, and hopefully that will start to redevelop the academic side of things. Um, another kind of way people are getting into ceramics is what I call the new old ways. So apprenticeships and internships are absolutely thriving at the moment. Um, Billy Lloyd here is a prime example of this. Although Billy did have formal training and a university education, um, he went on to do an um, apprenticeship with Julian Stair, and that was his route into the market. So he started to work with somebody who knew what they were doing, fed from their experiences, worked for them, but also alongside them. And that's how he's really ended up where he is today, a very successful maker. And then there are the other side of things. So um, we've got the benefits of private institutions like the kiln rooms. You know, we don't have criteria to fill. We don't have anybody to answer to. We answer to ourselves, and we have a mission that is the development and the uh, recreation of ceramics to keep it relevant today. Um, now, some of these institutions are very different. You know, you need to make sure if you're going to one of them, this is a plug for the kiln rooms, by the way, um, if you're going to one of them, you need to be in the right place and make sure that you're working with people who are directing these places in the right manner. Um, because it, there's such an interest around it now, it's very easy for somebody to open one of these and create a business out of it. It's not necessarily the, the drive that will help you along the way. You need to make sure that you're working with practicing artists and that the vision is uh, to develop you as a maker and to push you through if everybody stayed with us now, there would be an infinite waiting list of people to come to the kiln rooms, but that doesn't keep it fresh for us. We need to be moving people through, so our new studio model is now a full-time maker's model, so when people have outgrown our open access studio, they move up, and they've got somewhere to go to. So it's, it's a cycle, but it's, it's a process that you can engage with outside of a, a formal course. Um, 
This also really kind of um, overlaps with the kind of more community college side of things like Morley, City Lit, Chelsea and Greenwich. They're all busting at the seams as well and um, they feed into us, we feed into them. And there's a real kind of education system growing in London that hasn't been around for quite a long time. Um, so regardless of your entry point, however you come into ceramics, whether you're working through a communal studio, in an apprenticeship, internship, whatever you're doing, um, you need to be proactive. 110%, it's up to you. Um, I think we are quite a lazy generation. <laughs> We're used to information being at our fingertips to the point where we stop looking for it. We stop paying attention to it. Um, when I started at the Royal College, um, one of the first things they informed us was that it was going to be self-directed learning heavy. And I was like, self-directed learning? I've just paid a fortune to be here. You better teach me. Um, <laughs> but actually, with hindsight, I mean, I was, I was young when I started. Um, I'm still young now, but I was very young then. Um, and I didn't understand it. But there's so much information out there. It's like we were saying before, you know, we're almost bombarded on a daily basis, but you need to take the responsibility for your own education. Whether, it's, whether you're already in a college or not, there's so much you can do to, you know, look, go out, be involved in exhibitions and things, listen to what people are saying, take part and read. There's a wealth of books out there that are absolutely fantastic. Um, and the other important side of it, which you know, obviously is quite close to my heart with the kiln rooms, is uh, to be part of a community. Working in isolation is no good for anyone, especially when you're starting out. Eventually, if you're constantly seeing people like I am, you might need a little bit of isolation, somewhere to hide. But um, being part of a community means that you're learning from each other's mistakes, and it's going to save you a wealth of time and loss along the way. Um, access and appreciation, two key points here that are completely bound together. Um, it's up to us as makers to keep ceramics relevant. Um, people need to experience clay in some form to, uh, to understand its value. We don't need to make it glossy. Uh, we just need to be honest and talk about it. We need to get it out there. We need to inform people so they have an understanding of the material and the process. Um, it doesn't have to be quick or, you know, compressed into a 30 second video where people think, oh, it's a quick process. It has to be honest so people can understand what we actually do as a career. Um, we need to write about it and you know, engage with it and read about it and have discussions and be open to talking about it and not scared of it in any way, shape or form. And you know, once people have access to and understanding of the material and its process, this leads to appreciation. Appreciation leads to value, and value equals cash. <laughs> and cash is why we're all here. So value and pricing. So this, as I said, is driven from access and appreciation. Um, but there are a couple of absolutely key points here. Not underselling is crucial to the development of the market for all. So when we have a show at the Kiln Rooms, for example, we have a pricing strategy so that nobody is outselling somebody else on the same level. If the marketplace is such that somebody is selling a very similar product for £5 or £40, most of the time in that price bracket anyway, people are going to go for the £5 thing. And that undermines the price of the £40 thing. And the £40 thing is normally the fair value for the work that's gone into that. So it needs to be balanced and it needs to be strategic and people need to actually think about it and pay themselves properly for their work. I hate, hate, hate seeing people underselling and undervaluing themselves and their work. Um, if you're going to deal with shops on a wholesale or sale or return basis, whatever way you're going to do it, if you're selling your work, you need to do your paperwork. It needs to be clear in black and white and kind of, you know, formalised so people can understand it and understand you and know what they're buying into. If it's all airy-fairy and, oh, maybe I could knock you a fiver off or whatever, people lose confidence in you, especially shops. You need to be, look, this is what I'm selling, this is how much it costs, take it or leave it. And if they leave it, that's not a bad thing because it means you're not underselling yourself. You, you might lose out on a project, but you're not losing out on yourself, I guess, within that. Um, where am I? Uh, so know your position, 
you know, are you self-employed? Are you registered as self-employed? Are you a sole trader? How does it work? Understand your tax, your VAT, and most importantly, understand wholesale value of your work. Um, so wholesale is obviously f normally 50% of your kind of recommended retail price. Um, so this is an example. I'm going to run through it really quickly, but if you don't understand it, maybe take a picture and uh, try and work it out later. Um, but basically, this is an example of uh, minimum pricing for functional wear. Okay? So per piece, let's say, I don't know, a, a large bowl, for example. No, Large-ish bowl at this price, not that large of a bowl. Um, so two hours work, you pay yourself a minimum of £20 an hour, it's what you deserve, you've trained for it. Um, don't ever undersell yourself at £20 an hour unless it's um, somehow going to regenerate larger sales in the future. Um, so it's taking you two hours at £20 an hour, that's £40. Work out your materials, now we're very fortunate in ceramics that our materials are probably the cheapest of any production method. Um, so your materials, in, including your glaze, is probably £2.50. Factor in your time for processing as well, and don't forget to add your carriage onto all of your materials as well. Um, work out your total firing costs. So if you're doing a biscuit firing and a glaze firing, maybe the two of them together make £60. Um, how many pots can you fit in that firing? Say 30 maybe. Um, so you divide that by the £60, gives you £2 for your firing costs per piece. Then work out your overheads, your studio rent, including your bills, £10 a day maybe, I wish. Um, and, you know, 10 hours of work in a day, I think that's a fair day for a potter. Um, 14 for me most of the time. Uh, so that works out to £1 an hour, it's taking you two hours, so that's an additional £2. So your total minimum price for your piece is £46.50, and that is your wholesale price. So galleries, shops, everything, they generally take a 50% commission off the top of a retail price. So we need to double that up to make our, wholesale pr uh, our retail price. So if you're selling to the public, that needs to still be your retail price. So it's the full value, but you, know, you have to pay for stands or whatever your outgoings are for that kind of thing. But if you're selling to a shop, then you're normally selling at a 50% commission. So you'll be selling at that £46.50. I hope that makes some sense to you. Um, so which market does your work fall into? Now, this is quite an important and uh, often overlooked factor that people don't really understand where their work fits. And now that's up to you to research. You need to go out and be in shows. You need to see what other people are selling their work for, which market they're selling it to, which shops they're selling it in. You need to know where that is because in between each of the markets, which I normally describe as functional, homeware, decorative, and fine art, you need to really mind the gap in between these pieces, in between these markets, because there are gaps in between them. And if you price in the gap, you tend not to sell. Sometimes it's better to charge more for your work than less um, to make sure that it sells. For example, in my range, I make a large platter which I used to sell retail for £100. And I probably sold in five years, I probably sold 10 of them. And uh, then I decided that I hated making them because they kept cracking in the kiln and they were a nightmare. So I doubled the price like that, £200. And I've probably sold about 50 of them since then. So there's something in that kind of mindset of value that I was selling that at too high a end for the functional wear, but then it was this huge plate and it moved into the price bracket of the uh, homewares and people bought it as a decorative homeware item and that was the price that they wanted to pay for it. So you have to be really careful of this gap and the, the biggest gaps are kind of between homeware and decorative and decorative and fine art. And if you're selling something that doesn't fit into each criteria at the wrong price, then you're not going to sell your work really. So this is, I feel like I've rattled through it. I was worried that I was going to be, um, how are we doing for time? Yeah, okay. Um, this is my kind of final point, and then I'll just do a quick recap. Um, above all else, quality must be your main drive in everything that you produce to sell. Don't take this as anything to do with this picture, but <laughs> inferior product is detrimental to everyone. A good picture does not a good pot make. 
It doesn't matter how beautiful it is in a photograph. In real life, the quality of that item has to be such that you can stand by it and know that you'd be happy to sell it to your mum. Um, <laughs> you can't be putting crap out into the world, and I'm sick of seeing crap out in the world. Um, it needs to be quality. You need to know that what you're selling is a quality product because if it's not, it's going to bring everybody back. It's going to hold us all back, and we're right in the crest of a huge wave at the moment. We are on top, so we need to retain that kind of quality thing. And you know, If you've just started out making and somebody orders 100 of them, don't rush it. Set yourself you know, reasonable timescales. Be honest with people. I can't produce 100 in a week. It doesn't work like that takes X amount of time. That's also educating the buyers so that they know when they're coming to the next person not to expect that. It's unrealistic. You need to be honest and to value your quality. Um, you need to work hard, don't cut corners, test and record and experiment, and make sure that everything you do in the background is relevant to what you're doing. Um, too many times, and I know there's a few college students here, too many times sketchbooks and work diaries and things are filled in retrospectively. They need to come before. There's a process to this. This is where we're going through. You need to do your experiment and to know what you're talking about. If you don't know what you're talking about, you're not confident in your product. And if you're not confident in your product, you can't sell it. You need to know everything inside out, and the quality has to be high. Take your time. Charlotte would kill me if she knew I had this picture up here. Um, take your time. What? She would. She would, yeah, she would. Um, take your time and actually look at what you've produced. The amount of times people get something out of the kiln and then it goes straight into wherever it's going, it, it, whether it be a gallery or a sale or anything. Look at what you've produced. Examine it. Understand it. Take the positives. Lose the negatives for the next batch. If you don't look at it, you make the same mistakes again and again and again. And people are constantly saying, oh, you know... I'm not sure about this, why has that happened? I'm like, have you actually looked at it? <laughs> you know, take your time, have a look, understand it for yourself, and then inform your next batch of product. Um, so finally, once you've done all of that, be proud of what you've done, and if you've followed all of this guidance, you'll deserve it. Thank you. Um, we do have time for questions, so if anybody would like to ask Stuart um, a question. I mean, I'd just like to say, you know, ceramic makers, potters are often known for their generosity. Um, but I think actually Stuart's gone one step further today um, with some brilliantly candid uh, insights and information that hopefully will help uh, many of you continue and grow. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Arnie. Hi, Stuart. Um, where do you stand on charging for samples if a company asks you to send them a sample for something? Um, it depends. I think it's, it's, you have to weigh it up. You have to weigh up the potential return for it. And if you think that it's well worth it and you can justify it as an investment, um, then I think, yeah, fair enough. But I think the vast majority of the time, if you're honest with the company right from the get-go... Um, then they will pay you for samples. So me, for example, with Calvin Klein, when they asked if they could have samples, I was um and ah and do it. Can I ask them for any money for this? You know, I had no idea. And then I, eventually I said, look, this is going to take me a week's worth of work. It's going to cost me two, three hundred pounds. Um, I want to charge you just for that. So, you know, a week's worth of work at 120 pounds a day, for example. And it worked out about 1,200 quid or something. And they got a whole bunch of samples, and they just said, yeah, of course. You know, we don't expect you to work for free. But I think there's something in us that we expect them to think that we will do it for free, and we don't even broach the subject. We're too scared. We hold them back. But I think you, this is what I'm talking about, about talking about it and be honest about it and know your fi facts and figures, and then you can ask for a legitimate price. And if they say no, then that's up to you after that, really. It's a grey area, though, really. Any further questions? Anybody like to ask anything? Yeah. Lady down there. Thank you. I know you talked about the international market. Yep. How do you deal with delivery? That's going to be a major... <laughs> Bubble wrap. cost risk. <laughs> 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 
Um, yeah, I mean, this is another thing. A lot of our um, members are starting to sell to you know European market in particular. Um, I've sent to date around about 1,200 pieces to New York, um, and it literally is bubble wrap and cardboard, and you just you have to lose some pots along the way to understand how to wrap a pot properly. I think um, I I have lost hundreds of pots in deliveries in the past. And now I just make sure that everything is packaged as if, you know, a monkey's going to handle it and throw it from tree to tree until it gets there. Um, so, I mean, that is the only thing you can do. There's, there's insurances and things like that, and it depends who's paying for it. So um, CK, for example, have a FedEx account which is insured. So if it gets broken or damaged, then they can claim against it. But some delivery companies won't insure um, ceramics. Um, you can use art handlers who will insure it, but they are charging absolute blinding fortune for it. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what to say other than wrap, <laughs> wrap it and pack it really carefully um, and make sure that the cost of it all is justified within the product that you're selling. Um, this is Pete Mike from Mm hmm. Usual? I've never heard of that before. Um, f if you didn't hear that question, um, basically she has been uh, invited to show at a gallery, but they're saying that they're insisting that she provides gift boxes to go with the work. Um, that's not something I've had an experience of, but I would say I'd be happy to do that, but I'm going to charge you for the gift box, and I'm going to charge you for my time for sourcing the gift box, and it's going to be cheaper for you to get a gift box yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, lady there. Hi, thank you for your talk. It's fascinating. Um, you mentioned that you started at the age of fourteen. You yep. grew up in, in with art, basically. I am somebody who is forty-two. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a scientist. I've never been to these uh, art exhibitions before. I came with my dear friend who does amazing work. Uh, when do you say it's late? For you to, you know, I'm. <laughs> it's never too late. We wouldn't have half of our members of the kiln rooms. I can't say that. <laughs> um, no, honestly, it's never too late, but it does take time to develop a skill in sure. anything. I don't think there is any age lim on, a limit on it whatsoever. I've met people who've started at 70 and who are now starting to sell their first pots at 76, 77. Um, there's no age limit on it whatsoever, but you just have to accept that it is going to be an investment of time in developing the skills, unless you go down the John O'Smart route, in which case you apply your previous knowledge. I'm not sure where the scientific pots are going to work, but um, you know, if you have previous knowledge from a previous job or something, especially designers, we've got loads of um, architects and illustrators and all sorts of people with actual transferable skills, and that speeds everything up a lot. So if you've had an experience, especially a life experience, in, in a career, then you'd be amazed the skills you already have that are related to ceramics. Well, science is all experimentation anyway. So. There you are. Yeah. I'd love to see your sketchbooks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get in touch. <laughs> Pick, picking up on that, Stuart, I'd like to see some of our students' sketchbooks sometimes. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> And it's the one thing we push more than anything else. They don't, mm. they don't get it in the first year. They don't no, kind of no. realise how, how important it I'm, is. I'm saying all of this, but God knows I was <laughs> guilty of it. <laughs> <laughs> but when, when you were talking about age earlier, that, that, it's interesting that... Because um, Stuart and I know, with the Kill Rooms, I, I also am the head of department down at Morley College, which is adult education. I've been very fortunate to have a foot in both here at St. St. Martin's for half the week and then half the week at Morley College. Um, and we've just done a very short interview for the BBC earlier. And obviously people at the moment, as Stuart's eloquently said, this interest in ceramics. But at Morley, we've always had four classes. So it's just that we have 150 people on the waiting list at the moment for those classes. So it, it's never gone away. This, mm. this sudden thing yeah. about... I talked about earlier about the Hoxton hipster and everything. It's... it's it's a generation who are coming to it who maybe didn't have it at school. Yeah, so we're seeing morely a lot of younger students, but some of our students are 80. You know, they're, they're producing great work um, and really accomplished work. 
But it is that thing about time, mm. that investment of time mm. um, that Stuart's touched on. Um, and, you know, do we, need, do we need all this work in the world? I mean, I say to students, if you, fire that, if you choose to fire that, it's going to be around for a few thousand years if it doesn't get broken. So take that into consideration mm. as well. We know clay is this fantastic, cheap, and most, you know, the Earth's most abundant material. Um, so it is that, but it's that investment of time, I think, which, um, again, Stuart touched on very eloquently. Um, but yeah, you're never, you're never too old to start, ever. Um, it's, it's, uh, sorry, here at St. Martin's, some of our students, we, we really pride on ourselves of having a mixed cohort. So we've got students in their 50s, 60s here, starting a degree. Um, so yeah, it's never too, you're never too old. Question in the middle. It's actually not a question. I just wanted to say I think that's such a... You've got a very good grounding for, to, to go from as a scientist <laughs> because it's so technical. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Part of it are. And 42 is a good be. start. <laughs> Thank you very much. I also do think that London is a special case. I think the rest of the country is somewhat deprived of uh, ceramics opportunities. Yeah, I mean, we, it, it's... we moved from London to Bournemouth and it's a cultural desert. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say? It's, uh... <laughs> you know, I'm not from London. In, you know, I, I went from Newcastle, my home, to Glasgow and then came here. So you know, I have a, a broad understanding of the, the north and the outside of London. And the only thing I would say about that is that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a demand for people who want to experience clay. And it does fall to us as our responsibility to provide some way, shape or form um, for people to be able to engage with the material. So if it's a desert, you'll have to be the oasis and everyone will come to you. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering about it from the perspective of uh, working with retailers, and I'm just thinking. Say that again, sorry. Emma. I'm thinking from the perspective of retailers. Retailers, sorry. And I'm wondering whether there are any retailers that you've worked with that had really good models that you enjoyed working with, or what sort of things from a retailer's perspective should they think about? The most, um, for the makers? most important thing I've ever found working with a retailer is having a personal relationship with one person. Um, it becomes not a very personal relationship, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but having uh, one point of contact who understands what you do and who has personally met you is fantastic. And it's even better if they come to your studio so they can actually understand what it is you do in the process. Um, when it's a large team, so I used to sell to Conran. I used to do Conran London and Paris. Um, and I had one personal contact there and then she left after probably six months of me working with them and I, I couldn't find one person to pin down after that to have that kind of working relationship with and I found it incredibly difficult to work with them they didn't understand who I was they thought I was just a supplier and I had a stock warehouse where I could just churn this stuff out from um, but that it didn't work like that and eventually our relationship broke down to the point where I would never ever ever work with them again um, and you know for me I was owed two and a half, three thousand pounds from them. And originally, when I had somebody to talk to about that, if my invoice wasn't paid, she would phone them up and it would get paid. But when I didn't have one person to talk to, I was talking to the accounts department, I was talking to the buyers, I was talking to this, that and the other. Nobody was really listening to me. Nobody cared who I was or, you know, they didn't realise that three grand to me was everything at the time. It was food on the table or no food on the table. Um, so definitely, if I was to give advice to retailers, then it would be just to engage <laughs> with the maker and understand that they're not a stockist with a, a warehouse, you know, they are making to order for you, and that's their life, you know, it's not just uh, the kind of production for value, you know. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? Yeah, at the back, Jane. Um, Stuart, I want to know what your future plans are for your own work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've caught me at a very interesting time, Jane. Um, so as I, as I said, we've just uh, opened, well, we've refurbished one and opened a brand new kiln rooms, which has seen me not engage in my own practice at all for the last two and a half months. 
Um, and uh, I've got some personal things in my life which will need some attention. <laughs> if you've been building for 14 hours a day in your studio for six weeks, you need to see your wife and your family. <laughs> um, and it, I'll be turning 30 this year, the grand old age job. <laughs> So I have made a decision that I'm going to retire my tableware range this year. Um, I've been called in the past a victim of my own success in that um, I've, my tableware range has been so successful that that's all I've had time to do. Um, and I am a ceramic artist or designer or designer maker, whatever you want to call me. And underneath, my hands want to be with clay and I want to do things that aren't constrained to just one form um, and while it's been fantastic ride for six years it is six years that I've been producing the same thing so I'm going to take a br personal break I'm going to concentrate on the kiln rooms a little bit and my family and then I am going to come back with something new <laughs> how, how big do you think the kiln rooms can grow and are you thinking about setting models up anywhere else? I'm just trying to catch Ben's eye. Ben's <laughs> my business partner and right. the, the uh, financial expert within our company. <laughs> ben would like it to be much bigger than it is right now, obviously. I want it, I, well, I see it growing slightly larger. Um, you know, we've kind of cornered southeast London at the moment for, <coughs> for our kind of model. Mm. Turn and Earth has northeast London. Um, there's definitely space for something broader in West London. In the uh, you know counties outside of where we are now, I don't know exactly how it would work. I know my old teacher has a, a smaller version of in Newcastle, which is seeing a huge surge of inf influence and people coming in, and um, you know, so it's it's not confined to London, but there is a population density in London yeah. that makes it very viable. Yeah. Um, in terms of the kiln rooms, I like to see us progressing not just by opening site after site after site, but mm providing services and providing opportunities for makers in London. So, for example, obviously we started off with an 18-hour-a-week open access model, which we now have a huge studio for. We've just opened our full-time makers space for 25 full-time makers. And in the next year, we're hoping to design and begin production of the Kiln Rooms tableware range, um, for which members will be trained to produce it and then paid piecework so they can um, actually help to earn for yeah. themselves and I don't know about a retail platform it's something people keep asking us if we would do because we've obviously got a wealth of makers mm. um, but I'm not sure I want to go down that road but for me it's my personal drive and you know everything I work for is to provide opportunities for um, other people to engage with ceramics and to develop the market on a broader scale um, so the kiln rooms could definitely grow, there's scope for it and there's people who want it. I mean, like I said, there's 400 people mm. waiting for classes. I'd like to be able to provide more services for that, but um, our goal isn't just a, a financial business model, it's a much broader perspective and being involved in things like this is kind of where, where we're moving into, I guess. Um, so where we'll end up, I'm not entirely sure, but we're, we're heading on that tra trajectory. Great. Um, I think... We should wrap it up there and just thank Stuart Carey once again. Thank you very much.